Hi, everybody. We're, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you to everyone who's been joining us. I'm Leslie Castellano, and I'll be briefly serving as the, the moderator for this experience. Um, and you are here at Arts and Culture, an Arts and Culture session specifically talking about public art. Um, I'll do, we're, we're closing some doors. <laughs> I don't know what to do. I, I won't be talking too much, so hopefully <laughs> we'll get through this out. Um, I do want to recognize that we're on indigenous unceded Weah territory here in Eureka. And I'm just going to open us up with a little bit of information about the economic impact of the nonprofit art sector. And this comes from Americans for the Arts. Um, the nonprofit arts and culture industry um, brings in $166.3 billion nationally, plus $102.5 billion in event-related expenditures. Accounts for 4.6 million jobs. And the organizations themselves bring in another $63.8 billion. Um, Tourism is another kind of key economic component of the arts and communities. And it's estimated that on average, 34% of all event attendees travel um, to a community specifically to see because of the arts or to see a production or, and that of those um, almost 70% traveled specifically only for that cultural event and would have chosen another area to go to if that if a cultural event that was meaningful for them wasn't taking place. Um, so with that, I do want to um, welcome everyone to the conversation uh, we have with us today. And, and I'll have everyone do introductions shortly, but Jacqueline Dandino um, from Arcata Playhouse. Alyssa Muir from the Mendocino Arts Council, Libby Maynard from the Ink People, Jill Richards from the Trinity Arts Council, and Swan Asbury from the City of Eureka Economic Development Department. Um, and I also want to recognize we've had a few members who have been, so th this particular group we've been meeting throughout the pandemic to really um, form a regional collaborative structure in which we can support one another, learn from one another. And so this group's been meeting for almost two years. And other members of our group who aren't here today are Stephanie Latour from Mendes, uh, sorry, from Del Norte County, um, Brittany Britton from HSU, Jemima Har from um, Humble Arts Council, Julie Feely, also from Trinity Arts Council, and Margarita Alford, who's also from uh, Trinity County. And so I just want to appreciate that they their conversations with them have also kind of helped set the tone for, for much of what we're bringing forward. And then um, we're going to go south to north <laughs> for introductions. So Alyssa, we'll go ahead and start with you. OK, so just. Um name and title and organization. Um, I can, I can sure. do that. Um, I'm Alyssa Muir, Executive Director of the Arts Council of Mendocino County. I've been with the organization since 2009. Um, I grew up in Mendocino County um, from two to seven years old and then spent a lot of time in other places, including the Bay Area, Switzerland, Central America, um, England, uh, there's there's some people outside. I hope you guys <laughs> they're hooting. Um, I hope I hope that's not coming across as well. But um, I can I can ask them to be quiet if if needed. Uh, yeah. So and and then I moved back. To, oh, at New York City, Seattle, um, and I moved back to Mendocino County in 2006. And uh, I just think it's the most this is the most beautiful region in the world. So. Um, I don't believe in perfect places, but this is as close as it gets. We'll go next to Libby. 
Hi, I'm Libby Maynard, uh, Executive Director of the Ink People, uh, also known as the Ink People Center for the Arts uh, in Eureka. And um, the Ink People is a uh, the local arts agency for the city of Eureka and a, a community cultural development organization. Uh, so we we work to uh, make the community a better place through the arts and by doing that through the people of the community. Uh, so we don't think that the that we know what's best for the community, but we know the community does. So we listen and make those things happen. Thank you. Thanks, Libby. And Swan Asbury. Uh, yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm the Economic Development Manager for the City of Eureka. And I was born and raised here. I went to Eureka High and HSU, and then I left. And um, I purposely moved home in 2015. I really wanted to work on Eureka, and so I, I got a job with the city, and, and I've been with the city for six years. And um, I was part of the team behind the Strategic Arts Plan, and I'm um, the staff for the Art and Culture Commission. Um, and I am also on the Ink People Board, and um, I'm also one of the organizers of the Eureka Street Art Festival, which is a dream maker of the Ink People. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks, Juan. And after we do our go around, we'll, we'll kind of get into a little more depth and show some of the slides that, that you sent us as well. Um, so we're going to go to Jackie next. Hello, my name is Jackie Dandino, uh, and I am the Executive Artistic Director of Playhouse Arts, the Arcata Playhouse here in Arcata. I moved to Humboldt County 18 years ago now, which is crazy, from um, Pender Island, British Columbia in Canada. Uh, I'm a Canadian green card holder, um, and I come from a background of traditional theater, Shakespeare, Shaw, um, and then started doing ensemble work, taught at Del Arte International for 10 years. Um, and with the Playhouse, we are the local arts agency for the city of Arcata. And these past years has been really great to really build a robust relationship with the city who um, are very supportive and awesome. One of our things is re resource allocation and how we take resources that we have and make sure that they're allocated and people have access to things within our community, which includes funding for whatever they're going to do. And uh, we we have um, a radio station called Humboldt Hot Air. We have a theater, a 150 seat theater. We do community art. We have artists in schools. And we're also running a project called Skuyet Sanina, which is a collection a collaborative work with the Yurok Wellness Coalition on opioid addiction and wellness. So um, I think that's all. We also do um, a women's festival every year in March and we're doing um, a family fun series. We do it every year in May. So um, that's who we are. I'm happy to be here with all of you. Thanks, Jackie. And I'll just go ahead and pass it to Jill Richards from Trinity. Hi, and I am Jill Richards, Trinity County Arts Council. We are the local arts agency for Trinity County. I grew up in the Bay Area um, from Berkeley to uh, Walnut Creek and found myself in um, Trinity County just for a stay over. Uh, that has lasted me um, 15 years, 17 years, uh, and I um, am the director of the um, Arts Council, which in our small community means you represent all of the arts industries in the county. Um, you have to find them and um, convince people that what they do matters and then uh, try to um, bring it forth and, and share all of what's taking place in all of our very distant regions with each other. And uh, it's a, a complicated thing, but very enjoyable. And it does mean travel, which is also fun in our, in our region. Um, being a part of this collaboration has opened our doors, expanded our vision of how to reach beyond boundaries 
and um, provided economic opportunities that we would not have had we not um, had the, the COVID uh, push to, to become a part of this regional arts leadership group. So um, Trinity County is eternally grateful. We've learned so much and uh, depend upon um, collaborations like this to um, ensure that we do our job right and provide opportunities equitably. So thank you all. Thank you, Jill. Um, it's been really wonderful getting to know all of you better through, through these regional conversations. Um, we're gonna bring it back to Alyssum and, and really just the, the conversation of kind of to open up, what are some, some of the things that your organization has been doing over the last couple of years? A little bit more detail about your organization and, and just how it relates to your community. And Swan will put up some slides here and there as you're talking. <laughs> okay, yeah. So we are a countywide arts council. Um, most of the counties in California have arts councils and they have, I would say like, like a similar mission, um, but the programs are going to be community specific. So what does that community really need? Um, our, some of our biggest programs are the, the calendaring that we do. We have an online calendar, a printed calendar. Um, we do a guide to the arts, which is a printed brochure. Um, promoting all of the organizations in the county. We also have a directory on our website of individual artists and arts organizations um, and, you know, annual events. So it's, it's a lot of promoting what, what's happening in the county so that when people come here, there are signs of organized life in the arts. It's easy to find, a, you know, search for a theater performance in your region. Um, we also have a Get Arts in the Schools program where we send professional artists into K-12 classrooms throughout the county. Um, for arts enrichment. We do poetry out loud. Um, we have a sculpture gallery at the Botanical Gardens. Um, and a big part of what we do is uh, these uh, place making or, you know, public art projects um, and fiscal sponsorship. So I, I did send a couple of images of, I sort of focused on just works of art that have happened in, during COVID in the past um, 18 months or so. Um, just to kind of acknowledge that this is the time that we're living in. And um, so, uh, um, Leslie, did you get a bunch of images or just a couple from me? I sent you. The, these are, yeah, so the, I, I ran out in the rain and took these photos yesterday. Um, of, of These are funded by North Coast Opportunities. They are mosaics that are on the old city of Ukiah, trash cans and these um, encircle a Alex Thomas Plaza, which is a plaza in Alex in Ukiah, California, which is the county seat. Um, so this commission to the artists was mostly the images are celebrating the place and the people here. So you see mushrooms and, and sort of some ferns. Um, so a lot of the panels celebrate the local landscape and community, but then we also have um, interspersed in them are disaster preparedness education concepts that came from Leasters, California. Uh, so safeguard it, your home. Um, there's one of them. There's also uh, pack a go bag, pack a stay bag, check on your neighbors, um, sign up to get text alerts. So these, these concepts are now kind of woven throughout this public art project, which um, I think benefits the community in an ongoing sense and got feedback from that funder that this was really one of the most successful of the grants that they made around disaster preparedness education. So I just wanted to kind of flag this as an example of what happens when you partner with the arts. Um, so this is an example of, of, of what we do. And this these types of projects really like they change based on what's going on in the community, where there's a request and a need for partnership with us. Um, we also recently completed a 60 foot mural in Juvenile Hall um, over the course of a couple of years. Um, those, the kids in the hall that, that worked on that mural, this is you know obviously a, a changing population all the time, but um, the kids that were there got to have a hand in making 
freestanding murals that then went into libraries in the county. Um, so I'm kind of always looking at like, how can we, uh, you know, accomplish a lot with a little bit um, and really serve the needs of the community. But um, we are, as I mentioned this in the last panel, um, we're a very, we're rural, um, we're under 100,000 population and that's very spread out over our geography. We're sort of fragmented by, um, you know, mountains. So driving anywhere, you're going to be on a curvy road. There's not, you know, it, it, there's not like one central hub, I would say, unless that's Ukiah, the county seat. Um, and then there are different things going on in different communities. The, the tourism tends to concentrate on the coast. So there are quite a few galleries and arts organizations there. Um, and, and then we have lots of very self-sufficient inland communities, um, with, with art centers. Our art centers are kind of like, I think of them as public libraries. Our communities think of them as public libraries. They're just as owned by the community as a public library would be. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think our organizations are, I think of them as like, very scrappy um, ve survivors. Uh, they're very loved and treasured by the community, um, but they they tend to be small and strong rather than big and and kind of spread out. And you know w where that can become a weakness if you're trying to do too many things. So I, th I think that you know like a little ecology. Everyone has has kind of evolved to really serve a specific purpose. Um, and survive in this environment. Uh, Leslie, were there other other images of? I'm sorry, I Alyssa. Think... I, I don't think I got those. Okay, uh, I sent them by um, in in a Dropbox, but that's okay. Um, if I can figure out a way to share them, I might do that later. But I I don't want to take up too much time. So that's kind of an introduction to. I think that did, did I answer your questions <laughs> sufficiently? <laughs> Move on and let someone else. For sure, definitely. Okay. Yeah, and thanks for all you're doing in Mendocino County um, for the arts. Um, Libby. Yeah, one of the, uh, the big things that I've been working on for uh, many years now is making the public aware of the uh, economic impact of the arts and trying to make people understand that if um, if we didn't have the arts we'd have really boring cars and clothes and houses and uh, that it takes the grassroots arts to really um, invigorate and uh, you know create the designers and the the people who influence every aspect of our lives. When the city of Eureka uh, was doing its um, general plan update, their consultants found that the arts economy in Eureka was actually bigger than the, um, uh, the fishing economy, uh, which we had always thought was really, really big. Um, so that means that the arts are really, really big. And uh, we really need to um, acknowledge that. Um, the, the pandemic, of course, has just been devastating to the arts, not only uh, because we, we in the arts really are communal and uh, reach out to all the citizens of the, of the community, but but because the arts were largely ignored at the government level, and so we didn't get um, guidelines as to how to, um, uh, you know, uh, open uh, safely or, uh, you know, whatever we need to do. Um, Swan, I'm wondering if we could do this in presentation mode, it would be a little bigger. Um, Anyway, this is um, 
I find it really hard to talk about what the Ink People does because we do so much. Um, we really uh, have responded to uh, express community needs. Uh, and we have a lot of programs, uh, you know, artists in communities and in schools. Uh, the, uh, we have classes, we have a gallery, uh, which we're putting together in a new site right now. We moved at the end of June. Um, and uh, we have a, a thing called the Ink Blotter, which talks about events and opportunities. Um, and we've been involved with the City of Eureka as the local arts agency and the Eureka Cultural District um, and the Arts and Culture Commission and the Strategic Arts Plan and have done you know lots of uh, public art things like the uh, funds for artist resilience which came about after the um the the pandemic and we wanted to find some way to uh, at least support some artists um uh leslie um our moderator and also um uh on my board of directors uh had started a, a gift card program we got she got um, she did a crowdfunding and we got money to, uh, just poured in to support artists to give them $50 gift cards at the beginning of the pandemic when everybody was losing their jobs and nobody uh, had figured out yet how to you know get back onto the internet and do those things for people who could um, and then the, the Humboldt Area Foundation and the uh, Wild Rivers uh, Community Foundation also um, gave us a chunk of money to start this Funds for Artist Resilience. And it was a tri-county program with uh, Del Norte and Trinity and Humboldt, of course. And we uh, put together, uh, you know, solicited proposals from artists and got some uh, wonderful uh, public art programs going. Um, and then the two main programs that the Ink People uh, has are the Mars Project, which is the Media and Arts Resource Zone. It's a free program for youth 12 to 26. And uh, also affiliated with it is the Jump Starts program, uh, which uh, sends artists into juvenile hall and these artists are mentors for the youth. They work primarily now in the digital arts. Uh, we have a music mentor and a uh, video graphics animation mentor who uh, are doing you know, fabulous work with uh, young people. And recently we've been doing uh, more work with um, uh, charter schools and the uh, community schools. Um, and then we have the Dreammaker program that is, uh, it's, it's like a business incubator, but it's for arts and cultural projects. And these are all community initiated, uh, led by those people who are the best uh, purveyors of uh, what's needed in their communities. It could also be individual dreams uh, of people. It could be a, a show or a book a video, um, but we also have many social justice programs uh, that involve the arts. So right now we have over uh, 100 um, uh, projects that are, um, fortunately, they're not all active at once. So <laughs> some of them um, only happen like once a year, like the Street Art Festival. Um, so the, that's the depth and breadth of what we do. Uh, we do have a radio program um, or station that we're working on in collaboration and partnership with the Weot Tribe. Um, so the the Ink People really looks to um, try to create jobs for artists in the arts, you know, so that they don't have to support themselves waiting tables and stuff at least that's the dream but we uh have really i think contributed to the economy in significant and uh, meaningful ways and really turned around the uh 
the city of Eureka. I mean, we located in Eureka um, some 40 years ago because we really felt Eureka needed the most help. Um, and I like to think that we're part of uh, how great Eureka is now. But we are countywide and, and obviously multi-county. So, uh, you know, we stretch out and share uh, our knowledge and benefits with uh, all those people, our wonderful creatives. Thank you. Thanks, Libby. And Swan, you're, you're up next. Yeah, um, I, I'd say for Eureka, there's um, some specific things that come to mind. Our strategic arts plan that was adopted in 2017, I mean, um, there's been arts programming in Eureka for decades, like that Libby was doing and Eureka Main Street was doing and um, like the Rural Bureau Mural Program. And I mean, the arts have been thriving in Eureka for a really long time. Um, I think the strategic arts plan kind of formalized the city's commitment to the arts um, and really got the buy-in from city leadership and city council and it really gave staff um, direction and funding to do projects. Um, most recently, this Tuesday, we adopted an economic development strategic plan update. And in that document, we have four guiding principles and arts and culture is one of them um, and I think that's really important I'm not when you look at all the projects that are in that plan I'm not competing arts and culture with a different project I'm saying I want arts and culture woven into every project we do um, and it's really just part of all city things that we're doing now. It's it's like, how can we integrate arts and culture into this? And, and I think that's appropriate for my role at the city um, and, and appropriate for the city and, and arts. And that's all I think. Thanks, Swan. Okay, and we'll, we'll keep moving north and, and ask Jackie to talk a little bit. Um, so uh, with the Playhouse, we've um, been working with the city of Arcata during this pandemic, which has been really an exciting continuation of our relationship with the city. Um, our mission is building community through the arts. And so um, looking at economic social justice through the arts, but also looking at arts as art for art so that how art changes who we are, both our kinesthetic response to space, um, hyacinth for the soul, and that we can actually, um, we can use the arts within social and, and political and, and equity and justice, and we can employ artists and they're a big part of it, but there's also the huge part of the arts that is just art. So going to see a show or seeing something or um, singing or having choral things available. All of these things are so important that the arts are so robust within our community. Um, and to come at it from a model, uh, not of scarcity, but of allocation and resources, because I think we do have the resources in our community and it's how we get them and allocate them rather than looking at a scarcity model of, um, you know, that you're coming to the door with your hand open all the time. So um, looking at creative placemaking on how it really affects our communities in terms of worker retention, in terms of um, how our kids are learning in school and innovation and um, how we, um, as an arts organization, as a local arts agency for the city of Arcata, are nimble and low to the ground and so can do things and react in a way that maybe a city and a county government cannot um, in the same sort of fast way. So in the pandemic, I know that artists were extremely impacted and I feel like arts organizations received from my organization, I received more funding, both federally, state, locally, and civically than I have before. And that I was 
we were able to turn that around to actually employ artists to say, what can we do in our community right now? So those are the slides that you're seeing that we did a show called um, Migrations that was part of a, a project we have called The Round Story. That's how do we get a, a completely round story from our community? So much in line of what Libby saying, who has been my mentor over these years. I've worked with Libby at the Ink People. Um, just when I was starting out with, with the Playhouse, I was her assistant, got to file for her and things. But um, how do we look at what the community wants and how do we engage community, not in like, hey, it'd be great if you came and danced in this show that I'm doing, but what do you as your community, how do you want to see it happen? And so that was migrations that then also worked with the city to walk through the city and be in all these city parks that nobody knew about and how um, people were like, wow, I didn't even know this park was here or you know, just having um, really uh, amazing experiences with that uh, production that was outdoors and that plays into some of the work that the city and the playhouse have done with the outdoor venues grant so um the city um used some of the block grant for an outdoors venues grant which then um is we are the sub recipient of it and we hire shoshana who is the outdoor um coordinator and we have tents and lights and sound and and permits available for people to produce events um, in the city of Arcata and so that we can start to see that money go into the hands of artists so they produce events and they get the funding from the event without having all the overhead and all the, the costs of that and yes Shoshana is amazing and it's great to be working with her on that outdoor venues grant another thing that we did was the wonder wagon because we have artists in schools programs we felt like kids weren't uh getting the arts in school because they were online and they were you know it it was a um a dearth we were teaching online but so the wonder wagon goes out and gives free art supplies to in locations um we connected with the red cross and went up to willow creek with the fires and gave out about 60 art kits to kids who had been evacuated kids and families and adults some of adults took the the things too. Um, and looking at how those um, kinesthetic responses to space and how people um, walk into something and it, it their, their idea of what is is changed, I think is one of the things that is really um, important about the arts. Um, what else did I want to say? I wanted to say something about um, the, the Creamery District as uh, uh, starting with the, we got a little grant from, not little, at the time was huge, from the National Endowment for the Arts. We got $50,000 from them and it was, it, you know, it, it was great. And it allowed us to start the Creamery District and really start to do some of those things like Libby saying, what does the community want? What do you want to see in the Creamery District? How would you like the Creamery District to be modeled? And we started with the first Creamery Festival where we did everything people asked. They wanted food, they wanted plants, they wanted a circus, they wanted public art. And we did it all and then we saw what worked and where it worked and how it didn't work and now as the local arts agency um i don't run the creamery district anymore so it is 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 moving itself forward and so looking at that is for creative placemaking and how it has a huge impact on our communities and i think it's so important to work locally with our cities and so important for the county of humboldt to um step into that and say Yes, this is important, not only looking at Humboldt Lodging Alliance to actually support the arts through the tourism, but for the county of Humboldt to recognize that the arts um, are beyond entertainment and beyond tourism and actually work towards a lot of the things that are in a county plan of worker retention about um, you know, uh, homelessness and houselessness and uh, opioid addiction and addiction and um, all of these things like Swan is saying, how the arts hand in glove with these things, but also how the arts bring joy and introspection and philosophy and um, wonder and possibilities to our communities uh, that I feel is so important. I'm so passionate ab about it. So I haven't been able to put my soapbox up for a while. So thanks for letting me haul it out and dust it off. Um, yeah. That's um, that's 
that's it. I mean, I could go on about what we're doing uh, with the strategic arts plan and, and things like that, but someone can phone me later if they want to hear more. Thanks, Jackie. Um, and I'll pass it to Jill. I'm just blown away by how much is going on. <laughs> um, in Trinity County, we are the arts organization and um, in a small community like Trinity County, we um, are called upon to reach out to work with all of the different organizations in our community. So while we are an arts organization, uh, we get called upon to support um, the schools, which we would do naturally in, in terms of providing online arts opportunities that teachers don't have time to research. Uh, we get called in by the car show to, prov to provide an arts um, opportunity with artists exhibiting art at a car show because they know that adding arts will add to their, um, their visitorship. Um, we get tapped on the shoulder by the Weaverville Chamber for the events that they do. And it seems that when you are a small um, community, everybody's responsible for ensuring that you have some kind of economic support. And so um, we don't get to just be a traditional arts community. We really have to look and ask ourselves, how can we infuse art into everything that's taking place so that there is the visibility of art? But also we have found that in a community that is divided as Trinity County, with a 45 minute drive in a mountain between one town and the other, with very different economic uh, strategies. Um, the separateness, the feeling of separation has really um, caused some problems with the community feeling united. Um, and then we have um, our immigrant populations tend to be in, in one, one piece of the community, whereas um, the sense that the um, the hub of, of Trinity County, Weaverville, which is where the county seat is, uh, people consider that we have opportunities that others don't. So as an arts council, our job is to try to figure out how do we un unify um, all of these different groups and pull them together so that uh, we don't have the separation and the dis divisiveness. And COVID has added to that, of course, because if ever there were insular communities, they became more insulated when they couldn't reach beyond their front doors. So um, our primary means of unification and, and creating equity has been through bringing experiential art to our community and then also through promoting of public arts. And what you see here is, and I only provided this one single uh, piece of art because this is what we uh, really focused on during the COVID experience, which I like to think of it as an experience that hopefully um, is informing how we go forward and um, how we've grown. Um, but this is um, a group of four artists that went to high school together discovered each other through art, as different as each of them were in the family um, tribe. Um, they all went, left the county and got their education. Then they came back and rediscovered each other as they were reaching out to provide some kind of a, um, a vision for the FAR grant, the Funds for Artist Resiliency that Libby was talking about, which the Inc. People Center for the Arts um, pulled funding together for the three counties and our county winner was this mural. And the mural has uh, done several things. For one, it represents um, a very small a community that feels that they're isolated, that they are um, separated between mountains, uh, between um, separated by economic strife with the uh, mining industry going away with the lumber industry uh, and their mill going away. You can see what looks like a blade 
and the blade represents the lumber industry that was their form of um, sustenance. Uh, and it represents the resiliency of a community which, though they have been struck by fires and economic strife, uh, they rebuild themselves like the phoenix coming out of the fire and have um, discovered ways of really promoting the various pieces of their community. Uh, their Narelmuk uh, Wintu Nation, you see the basket in the corner. Uh, they are embracing the cannabis industry and the farmers and all of the, um, the new residents that aren't necessarily counted in our census, but are really expressing their, um, their community in terms of opening restaurants and um, being a part of the schools in a large way. So this is a mural that was developed through the FAR funding and the, um, like I said, it represents the resiliency of a community and the bringing together of four, four kids that left and came back and have rediscovered their community. It, um, and on a larger scale, it, it reminds us of the way in which public art actually does unify. Uh, for Trinity County, we have found that the, the way for us to really promote art as an economic driver and to bring people together has been through experiential art. So that uh, public art for us is murals and we only have six. So we don't really have a lot to talk about in terms of murals, um, but we have really been pushing the experience of art. We have found that while art festivals have always been the bread and butter for our arts community, providing artists an opportunity to share and sell their work, uh, get the visibility on a wider scale, uh, people aren't buying art like they used to. Uh, not in that respect, but families uh, and people who really don't have a sense of being a part of the arts world are opening their minds and their vision when we do it, when we provide experiences. So we've had interactive murals during Peace Week uh, where um, people can come by and they can draw a picture. We started the mural. We work with the high school uh, and the internship program to create a large mural that was in a public space. Uh, they had to create the vision of peace as they and their high school minds considered peace could be. And then everybody in the community was invited to, to draw pictures and put messages and people responded to each other's messages. And this mural, which was only going to be up for a week, has been up for a year and a half because people keep writing on it. They keep adding uh, their visions. They argue on this mural, but then they also find uh, uh, well, they're communicating and, and they're, they're pulling together and they're recognizing differences are not so uh, vast. So this mural has been, interactive mural has been a fun idea and we've been using it a lot at all of our events. Uh, we do a monthly art walk, which in Weaverville involves roughly 15 businesses over a one and a half mile stretch. Um, during COVID, when people were sick and tired of being in, they, they exploded it with the idea of coming out and dancing to music. But we, as an arts council, have to inf enforce the mask wearing. Not a popular thing in our county. Certainly not popular in certain regions of our county. But um, bringing music that appeals to everybody brings people from all reaches of our community together. And now where there was separation, now everybody's dancing under the stars and wearing their masks and bringing their food and sharing their experiences. And uh, along with that, we had more pop-up art and another uh, pop-up mural for people to just splash art to the sound of the music and, and get wet and get dirty and, and play. We brought a ceramics wheel out and allowed people to play with clay and feel what it's like to um, experience something they've never done. We had a batik artist who allowed people to create their own little handkerchiefs in batik 
oh, I can't do art. Well, you can't do art, but you can certainly uh, play with this experience and walk away with a handkerchief. So we have found that by making art experiential, people who don't have a sense of art realize that anybody can do it. And it, it pulls people together as they watch and, and they, they share. Um, tourism has become our primary way of really integrating the community. And as a small county, uh, we are responsible for promoting Trinity County as a destination. And we use arts as our purpose for creating a destination. We have more than 53 businesses that contribute in a really tangible way to the creative economy. And that's, that's actual real art with businesses that show art, sell art, um, sell materials that are used for making art, uh, provide workshops, et cetera. So our job is to reach into each piece of our community, uh, discover where the, um, I'm sorry, I'm rambling. Um, you're great, Jill, but I'm, I'm going to jump in there and, yeah, and because I think you've done a, a really, and in fact, everyone's done a fantastic job of kind of showing how the arts are essential to the economy on like many, many different stratas. But still sometimes, you know, I, I think in, in some folks like Jackie, you touched on this, you know, the arts are the first things to get cut or, you know, and, and so how can arts leaders kind of work together with the community, with people who are here, you know, attending this conference to, to help convey and recognize the essential nature of the arts? Like what, what work needs to get done? And I know Swan, and I'm going to dovetail this with the, you know, the strategic arts plan. And, and I know Arcata is also working on the strategic arts plan. How might strategic art plans be part of that conversation? Um, how does economic development planning um, affect the arts? Um, I, I think you kind of had two questions there. Um, there's so many things that keep popping up while you all are talking. I, I think one thing for a municipal perspective, I mean, sometimes I ask myself, is it appropriate for the government to be involved in arts? I mean, we're in the business of running a city should we be involved in this? And over time, I, I feel really strongly that we should be. And, and it's because public art communicates so much to your community. It communicates you are safe. You can be joyful. You can be vibrant. You can be playful. Um, it just instantly somebody driving through town sees, wow, this place is thriving. This place is alive. It says to your citizens, you can express yourself. Every voice here is welcome. Um, as far as strategic planning, I think it just, I, I guess, like when I first started with the city, I, I was the admin for the planning department. And part of that role was taking the minutes for all the different commissions. And I really noticed a difference with the Art and Culture Commission compared to the other commissions it was just kind of treated differently. And it was the norm. It was normal to the commissioners and it was normal to everyone. And so I felt like the strategic arts plan really said, no, the city is gonna have a commitment to the arts. This is formal. We are gonna complete these projects over the next few years. And going through that public process, it really put it on everyone's radar and it really made everyone say, yes, this is important to us. And now it's integrated into a lot of our planning documents. And our city council is very supportive of the arts. I mean, we have artists on our city council. And so it's it's like, it's so now like integrated into the business of the city. I think that's like having that plan that gets that buy-in and has that public process is, is a it's just a pathway and a map to keep it going. I'm done. I'd like to, to weigh on that if I could. Um, a lot of times when we talk about um, 
strategic arts plan and arts agencies, we talk about public and community art in terms of visual arts. And when we look at the performing arts, um, it becomes a different, um, uh, you know, I use the word kettle of fish a lot, but it does become a different kettle of fish because it's not as visible to someone driving through town that there is a musician practicing in their house that then is going to play at someone's art gallery or at someone's bar that then is going to make money off them playing and that people want musicians at events um and how do we support uh, my vision is how do we support the artists on the back end so not only the front end that the public sees but on the back end in terms of time and energy spent honing their craft that then they show up and they make two hundred dollars at an event on a weekend which is a large sum of money for an individual band person to make in humboldt county someone who's a musician and how do we educate the public i think on the back end of that so what it costs to be an artist not only um, financially, but uh, in terms of time, in terms of where you live. Uh, and it does cross over into visual arts, but a lot of times when we talk about public art, we forget that um, performing arts thing. How long does it take for NCRT to get Hamlet up and running with all those people? And how long does it take for that show to be shut down? And where do all those people go? And what happens to that cast? And what about those artists? And how long do performing artists keep sort of bumping their heads against a wall before they say, I have to do something else to support my family. I have to move, I have to do, you know, it's the age old thing. Um, and not to take away that from, from um, visual artists, but just to put the, the performing arts in that pile. Um, because a, a lot of times when we talk community art, we don't think that way. So I'd like to jump in and thank you, Jackie, for bringing that out. Um, one of the, the effects of the pandemic has been that many, many uh, arts organizations, as well as artists, are shutting down or on the brink of shutting down. And communities risk losing their vitality. They risk losing the, the very thing that makes them livable. Uh, and I, it's going under the radar. Uh, Americans for the Arts found that you know 95% of artists lost work, lost income in the pandemic. And not just a little, but I mean a lot. Some of them lost all their income. So we, we have these organizations that are right now on the brink. And it's just, I mean, to me, horrifying to see, uh, you know, what's happening to the arts community, not only in Humboldt, but in all the, the regions. You know, it's um, because they're not actively uh, recognized as essential. And uh, I don't know how to make it more clear. I mean, every artist is a small business. Every artist, whether it's a visual artist, a performing artist, uh, a literary artist, a digital artist, contributes to the economy of the place they live and you know, has that money that goes and circulates in the community 10, 12 times. Uh, so, I don't know, um, I don't have an answer, but somehow if we can figure out how to raise the public consciousness that arts are not just fun, but they're essential to the way we live and who we are as a people. Thanks. I'd love to make the case for the awesome power of public art and what happens in our public spaces right now. Um, and it kind of requires rewinding about 40 years back to 1980. Um, when I was a, a, a kid, I remember there were just a few television stations on the TV. And so everyone was getting the same nightly news. And uh, there was a sort of sense of shared reality um, among people. Uh, 
the country specifically, like there, it wasn't as divisive and fragmented. Um, there were, there are definitely arguments to say like that, that wasn't the richest field of information. Um, but what happened is, you know, with digital, with analog going to digital, we got a proliferation of channels and stations and people started getting their information in lots of different ways and believing certain sources and not others. And we, we got to a, a situation now where I would argue that we're kind of living in our own little bubbles. We're, we're, we're living in our own little reality and social media feeds back kind of, you know, what we click on and, um, public spaces are one of our very few sites of shared reality. That's where we're all asked to go 25 miles an hour, 55 or stop here. Um, you know, what we see is what exists. This is our shared space and our shared reality. So public art, in addition to doing all of those things that Swan was talking about, communicating that a, that a place is loved, that it is safe, um, that uh, everyone's, you know, words are welcome, their, their, their identity is welcome there. It does all of that. But in addition to that, it, it is a site of, of common reality. So those factors become like real social anchors that unite a community, especially during a pandemic. Um, and, and so the visual arts have been really fortunate to be able to continue fairly uninterrupted um, and even receive kind of enhanced recognition during the pandemic that these are values that are um, that are being provided by these these works in public space. Um, we may not be you know gathering indoors, but when we're outdoors, you know, in our communities, that we really get a a sense of um, of that common reality. So I think like if you know if I were someone in in business or I were or not business, but you know, government, I would, I would definitely see this as, as a really important um, thing to invest in, in the community. This is like a real um, uniter, even the, even the, the conversations that, that community members have around public art are in themselves what create community, those differences. As you, as you know, what I'm seeing in Ukiah, as we get more and more public art, is that just the tolerance level kind of rises people realize like you don't have to love everything like you might have your favorite mural and then within that you have your favorite detail but but there's going to be something for everyone and um and that those conversations are themselves important uh, oh sorry go ahead go Jill. I was just going to say it seems to me though i mean in our community the way for us to really uh, be perceived as valuable is for us to be utilizing art in the form of promoting tourism because tourism is the is the umbrella that wraps all of our community all of our businesses uh, whether they're arts related or not into um, an economic plan and all of we communities have the assets to develop uh, you know a tourism vision and there's funding out there for that. So I'm looking at arts and cultural tourism as our primary economic stream these days to, to keep everything afloat and using that as our way to promote our festivals and our murals and all the various different public arts that um, we're wanting to produce. And one thing that's come out of this regional conversation um, is, is this idea of like, hey, we have, there's, there are a lot of sculpture programs in Sonoma County, right along Highway 101, Cloverdale um, and Geyserville both have sculpture programs within, you know, a mile of 101. And then Eureka has um, murals throughout the city. So you, Ukiah and the towns along Highway 101, like we can kind of fill in that missing link and then together, like regionally, this whole North Coast corridor along Highway 101, there's the potential to tell the story of this as a public art mm -hmm. destination um, for the drive market, which is where a lot of the visitors are coming from now to our regions or San Francisco, Bay Area and Sacramento. 
So, um, you know, collaborating at a bigger scale and thinking like outside the county um, that we live in, that, that's kind of low hanging fruit. And, um, and we're working on it. We're working on getting a lot more work, works of public art um, so that we can, we can actually tell that story. And actually, tourism can provide an analytical um, value to the arts because we're able to get, you know, you know, website hits that prove that we're doing the job that deserves funding and that and that people are coming for the arts in particular. So we now have proof that we do have a value to our community. That kind of leads me to one of the things, um, one of the solutions that I've kind of been thinking about in my head, and I'm just going to spit it out and it's not been thought through, but thinking about aligning with other industries like the farmers, because I feel like farmers and artists have a lot in common of the work that a farmer does to get the food to the table, especially like a small organic farmer and an artist as businesses and tourism and how we begin to look as the, at the arts, not as sort of this special sort of um, calling artist in the garret kind of thing where you just do it because you love it, which is true. But, you know, a person starts a manufacturing business because they have some sort of deep seated passion about manufacturing jam or farming and how we look at these industries, perhaps if we begin to look at them as um, how we align with other industries rather than how we are separate from other industries, mm -hmm. that that would go a long ways towards um, making an economic argument so that as a business, I employ, you know, for FTE in the county of Humboldt, I pay taxes, I pay payroll taxes, I pay all of these things, and how I can align that with other industries that are small business industries. Um, and while I do believe that the arts um, have, you know, from my passionate point of view, I would argue that I could sit with a farmer and we could have the same sort of passionate vision of what our, of what we bring to our community or to sit with someone in, um, in tourism or to sit with someone in small manufacturing. And so maybe it's a matter of, of doing that because like you look at, I look at the Chamber of Commerce, for example, and they get funding to then support small businesses and that that organization is funded. So what about funding local arts agencies and agencies that represent an area that then it's like the, that money trickles out into the to the artists and that the support for the artists is there. Um, I don't know. I'm just sort of trying to think of how do we, because data collection is not the way, because we've collected data and we have data and we've put it forward to economic councils. This is data. We are this. And it still doesn't happen. And so, you know, like with the whole um, CARES funding that came into the county, I must say that there was such a level of frustration in me that that the arts, it was like, yes, the arts are very important. Yes, the arts, you know, we love arts alive. Yes, you're doing great work, but no, we're not actually gonna give you any money to do it. So how do we align ourselves with, I'm repeating myself, how do we align ourselves with industries that share some of our common things? Many small, independent businesses following one industry needing general infrastructure and support that is not a capitalist and i'm going to use the word capitalist that's not a venture that necessarily makes money that that is not its goal like education like healthcare should be like farming all of those things that 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 need the subsidy so that um, like in the last conversation, you don't have to spend $60 to go to a show and then you have this sort of elitist thing going on where only people with money can have things. Okay, so that's my thought on how, because um, I think the need is apparent and the how is not. So, I'm, I'm, oh, okay. Um, so if the arts were given more economic consideration, like what effects might that have in the community and in the region in general? Huge. I mean, I think 
I'm just going to jump in again because I talk a lot. So just shut me down when you need me to stop talking. But um, I think that this year for the Playhouse, we have seen a lot, an influx of income from the county, from the state and from the city and cooperation with these organizations, which then allows us to do things like the outdoor venues with the city of Arcata, allows to put the the infrastructure into the hands of the artists allows us to offer programming in schools for a discounted rate so that all schools can have it, not just rich schools and schools that have the money, um, allows us to offer um, rent um, free to our space, to the Arcata Playhouse, for bands to rehearse, for ballet, for Loaca to come, for um, Tropicana, Salsa Tropicana to come and rehearse, for Centro del Pueblo to make preparations for their you know, whatever's going on. And so the more that we have that back end funding, the more we can offer it for free, the more artists can get out, the more we can do things, um, you know, working with other organizations. I think if you can support that infrastructure and the infrastructure can then turn around and give it to artists for free and very little money, I, I think that the effects are massive. And I think that the community art, both, um, performing arts and visual arts and radio arts and digital arts and um, vi um, literary arts, uh, time and space, it would give that time and space and resources. That's not necessarily always just handing someone a check, but handing someone the time and space. That's what I feel that kind of funding would allow which then goes into creative placemaking of worker retention. How do we get doctors to come here and stay here? How do we get dentists to be here and stay here? How do we support small local businesses with artists that are local so that they can design their logos, so that they can write their radio commercials, so that, you know, it just begins to spin into itself. The more that you can support that, it's not like supporting an artist so they can introspect in their belly button which they may do, but it may come out their mouth something revolutionary. Um, there. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Reagan proved that trickle down economics doesn't work on the government level. But I think what Jackie's talking about is that on the local level, maybe it will work. Um, because we've been seeing um, the is that me? Hmm. I'm getting some kind of feedback. Anyway, um, yeah, the, a lot of the uh, the government money that's come through with the pandemic um, has uh, gone to businesses, but not arts businesses. A lot of it has gone to um, you know, to governments which need it because governments are, uh, you know, strictly uh, underfunded because people think they don't want to pay taxes, uh, not realizing that the taxes are the things that support, you know, support making their life uh, easy and healthy and uh, livable. You know, we've, if we can invest in our arts organizations, it's, Arts is embedded in everything. So if we can invest in our arts organizations and our artists, we can really improve the economy because there will be that multiplier effect. We can improve the livability of the places where we are. We can improve uh, just about everything. Health, housing, transportation, all of those things will be improved by integrating the arts and paying for it. You know, we are basically, we started as a Puritan um, society and we are still in many ways a Puritan society that thinks that uh, anything that seems to be uh, positive and fun and uh, enlightening is bad. And we have the uh, ability, I think, to change that now. You know, after the Civil War, um, when the uh, robber barons had so much money, uh, before that, the, you know, like in bars, there would be operas sung by the people in the bars. There would be, you know, real community and hands-on engagement in various arts activities. 
And then the robber baron wives said, oh, we want the arts to be just for us. We don't want that riffraff. And we're still suffering from that. So, yeah, that's one of my rants. Uh, Susan brought up, Susan Seaman brought up, uh, you know, the child care has many same issues, and it's true. But what do, when you're working with kids, what do you work with them with? The arts. That's that's how you get to the kids. That's how they learn. You know, it's just, yeah, child care and the arts are very similar, I think, because people assume that uh, for some reason the arts aren't very, uh, and child care are not that essential, or somehow, you know, it's something in the background that shouldn't get a lot of money. Um, Sabrina uh, Miller has been putting some great stuff in the chat about the work that Cooperation Humboldt's been doing. Um, the, uh, there's another organization called the Humboldt Creative Alliance that's been uh, meeting for several years now. Uh, and uh, Jackie and I are uh, kind of co-leading co a grant about disaster preparedness in the arts, uh, which Sabrina is uh, uh, an amazing uh, worker putting it together and uh, tying it in with uh, Cooperation Humboldt, uh, what they're doing. Um, this is really a... Um, you know, and there, nobody had thought, you know, about, you know, what happens when there's a big earthquake or a big flood and, uh, you know, the, the local museum or the local theater have all their assets uh, damaged. You know, how, how do they preserve them or how do they protect them beforehand? And then when it all happens, how do we uh, bring them back? How do, how do we restore what's been damaged? You know, it, and people all think about businesses and inventory and well, you know, we have inventory too. And what we do with that and how we affect our communities is all essential. I guess I'm on my soapbox again, sorry. <laughs> and, and Alyssa, I saw you turn your microphone on. Did you wanna add in something, Alyssa? Oh, yeah. Um, Libby sort of touched on it, but I think the question was, you know, if we really invest in, in the arts, what might that look like? And I know we talked about like a lot of the, the ways in which the arts contribute to the economy, like artists are small businesses, artists are entrepreneurs. Um, we talked about tourism and I, I don't know if anyone mentioned, but cultural travelers stay longer and spend more. Um, we talked about like recruitment. I know our local hospital when they're when they're talking to prospective physicians to move to the community, they have our brochure and, and talk about the you know what's what's happening in the arts and culture in the in the region and that can be an, an incentive for someone to move to the region. Um, and you know these tend to be green industries. They're not you know extractive or polluting, um, and that that is good. Uh, for quality of life and um, but also one thing that has come out of the fires like in that have plagued our region in 2017 we um, in the Redwood complex fire there were 500 homes that burned down and that you know th there was a, the, a consortium of Bay Area foundations came and hosted a a focus group where they really asked like, you know, what were the impacts of that on the arts community and um, the lack of a large scale art facility in the inland region was a real um, impediment to recovery for this community because people's studios burned down. There was no like central gathering space to go and make art and also host workshops, host you know, coming together, kind of healing projects around around um, using art, whether it's like writing poetry or um, we did we did have those types of workshops. We had actually the same mosaic artist Elizabeth Raby. Um, she invited for fire survivors to come to her studio 
bring fragments from their home sites and then make a new piece that they could carry into their, you know, future that included a remembrance of their, you know, what was lost and an acknowledgement of that. And so they made these, these works that were significant to them in a private sense, but they also worked together on a community built mosaic that honored the, the nine people who lost their lives in the fire. So there was, there, you know, it, it's, it's, it has nothing to do with economic development. This has to do with community healing, but the, um, you know, if, if you have to think of this in a certain way, think of it in terms of, you know, disaster preparedness and resilience that by supporting these, these organizations and efforts that you are actually building in resilience, um, in, in the case of a natural disaster. Um, and I think that's something that people tend not to think about, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's really important and, and disaster pre preparedness is not, it's not like a sexy thing that people are like, oh yeah, it's Monday. Let's think about that. But, um, we do have a, we do have some resources on our website to kind of try to get organizations to have a disaster preparedness plan, um, and then link to national resources around that. Um, but I think, you know, from a, a policy standpoint, just understanding that, um, that you have to build that capacity in when, when things are not happening, when there's not a crisis, that's when, that's when the time to do it is. Um, yeah. So, um, I, I just want to throw out, um, you know, a, a topic that's been tossed around over the past couple of years is an art tax on a countywide re like level of possibly having TOT revenue go towards supporting arts organizations or um, if it would be associated with property taxes. But anyways, a lot of communities have these ZAP taxes, zoo arts and parks taxes, um, just a, a tool to throw out there. That's also, interesting. Like, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I just also want to mention having regional or countywide event guidelines, I think would be very helpful in a COVID world. I think you see each city trying to navigate outdoor events. And so having like a countywide, how to have an outdoor event um, that everyone knows what the, you know, how to do it safely, I think would be helpful for all of our organizations that are trying to do, put on productions and are struggling. I think that's one of the things Humboldt Creative Alliance is working on as well. Not I think, I know it is. Um, it's one of the things the Humboldt Creative Alliance is looking at is what is a tax and how would that how would that work in, you know, we were kind of hot to trot on it before the pandemic came and now we're hot to trot on it again. Um, and I know Libby and Fran Beatty and Calder um, from NCRT have really been looking at that for Humboldt County and also the TOT tax, how we uh, get some of that tax, uh, TOT tax money to flow towards arts organizations and arts events. So I, I think that that's, that's a really, um, a really conversation that's on route right now and, and Humboldt Creative Alliance is having that conversation. And so if anybody wants to get jump in on that conversation, um, you could contact Libby or myself or Calder and um, jump in on it. We actually get a third of our operating funds from the TOT tax. Well, from, from the money that we get and the match that we get through the California Arts Council. But we would not be receiving that money if we were not able to prove to our community that we are creating Trinity County as a travel destination. So uh, it's not because we are an arts organization and we bring livability and provide economic development for our arts community. It's because we are promoting the county as a whole with arts as um, an integral um, drive or, or draw rather. 
So, uh, you know, the TOT taxes become a, a general fund in so many cases. And the moment you try to um, specifically call out how the money's to be spent, you have to get a higher percentage vote if it's a voted in piece. So again, you're, you're trying to convince your community that art matters, that it's not something that is a hobby, that you can just do that, you know, get a job and do this on the side. You know, uh, it's, it's amazing how, as Libby was saying, people don't recognize that art infiltrates every thought how they dress, what their what their house looks like, the car that they drive, everything in your life has, has some relationship with um, design and art, and people um, are so Im immune to the, the the conversation that we have to reach beyond that, and uh, it's it's a frustrating thing to not be able to let art matter because of the intrinsic value. I just wanted to say something that popped in my head. What if people do know that, that the general public does know that and understand it, but the actual political leaders and the people who are in the rooms making the decisions don't understand it or don't want to understand it? I'd like to posit that uh, the people may be our greatest strength in that I think people actually do understand that tenant and we can't seem to push through the ceiling um, to make that understanding uh, a policy. It's, you know. So the relevancy of art needs to be a campaign that is lodged in every possible uh, venue through every media right. so that people recognize that. Uh, like Shoshana's got these buttons, these stickers that came out of HCA that are like, I'm an artist, I'm a small business, and I vote and how voting and wow. voting as an artist would be, uh, you know, it, sorry, it, it suddenly occurred to me about that. So that that could be a, a thing that we could have campaign wise uh, through Love many that. districts, um, you know, all, all the different counties to make it known that we are artists and we, or we're, we support the artists and we vote because I think there is an understanding amongst people that the arts are important. I think every mother or probably most mothers have pinned their kids art on the fridge. <laughs> so I, I think that Jackie's right. And I think that there may be something that we're overlooking and that is that our governmental leaders are um, probably basically in trauma uh, because they are inundated every day, every hour, every minute with uh, all these crises that are happening in their cat in their communities and uh so they don't you know for them the arts doesn't rise to the top um so i don't know if thinking of it you know thinking of approaching them in a different um uh way you know trying to relate to them in the space that they are at uh that that would make our success better um, anyway, I see we have people popping on who want to join the conversation. Is this a good time for a question? <laughs> I say yes. yes, it's always a good time for a question. <laughs> um, I'm just, so I, I put it, I think I put it in the chat or in a private chat maybe. I own a downtown building in Covalo, and I'm just using this as an example. Um, I put up a mural. I had I paid somebody to put up a mural over 10 years ago, and it's right in the center of our town. Um, I grew up in Covalo, really, so I know a lot of the community members, most of them, and I know that there are artists here that I went to school with, um, you know, and and then also in other generations, um, but. I, I'm, I have a hard time connecting with those artists. I own a print shop and I print on clothing. I did a kind of a campaign to, to include artists in some where we would share the profits of, of clothing with their art. And it would be a short, short time, you know, period that we'd run their art. And it didn't really stick like I really thought it would because I really felt like there are more artists in my community. Um, and I do feel well received by the people that I know who are artists. I do think that somebody touched on this earlier that artists tend to have other jobs <laughs> because they can't support themselves. So I think what I was finding was that a lot of the artists that I know of didn't feel like they had the time to get 
to participate. They thought it was a really great idea. They said, yes, I want to do it, but then they didn't follow through with it. And I mean, despite my efforts to like remind them and ask them how I can help them and all of that. So I, I, so here I am now with this mural project. I want to repaint this mural. It's been over 10 years and I want it to be kind of also a symbol of how do I include my community more. And I mean, I don't, not that I need you guys, but you guys seem like the experts here. How would you guys suggest, um, do you have any tips for how I might um, connect better with the, the artists? I know they are there. Um, how do I connect with them? How do I pull them into the project? Um, I mean, paying them, of course, is, is one way, but outside of offering to pay, because I don't want it to just be one, necessarily one artist being paid for this job. I'd like to have artistic input first. Ideas? <laughs> yeah, we have a, um, on our website, we have a call to artist section. So that's somewhere you could post the opportunity for sure. And then see, um, you know, what happens, what you get back. Um, probably, I mean, Covalo Round Valley is such a, a small, very highly networked, location um in mendocino county it's a really tight-knit community so mm -hmm. i feel like even better than using our website would actually be word of mouth and just reaching out to artists um i do you know jen Procacci? she's on our board yeah. and is yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, and she's on she your did, okay yeah she's on our, our she's a, one of our board members yeah and, i watched yeah, her paint a mural <laughs> and she's a muralist she has a yeah. mural in the library and um and yeah so i but I think the challenges of, of sort of maintaining a program and getting people to, you know, follow through and be on time, I think these are just like, these are the, the challenges of arts administration. Like, you know, any, any, anyone who um, tries to kind of bring things up to the next level, I think reaches these, these sort of challenges. We have one of our supervisors actually is, the, is responsible for gathering all the first Friday event annou announcements and then passing them through the me to media and it's you know there's always nudging of of the mm -hmm. participating venues to get them to you know and i i don't know if there's a simple easy answer like we try to automate it and have our website anybody can put an event online so it's it's every it's sort of self-managing um you put the event online and then and then we use it in multiple ways but um you can lead a horse to water. I don't know what else <laughs> yep. to say about <laughs> I mean, do you guys suggest the nudging? Like at some point I stopped nudging and just stopped the project. I mean, I'm the, I'm, I'm going back and forth between the mural and the project where the, the print, the artist printing on clothing project. But with, yeah. the, with that artist project I did, I had some success with it. And the point really wasn't, uh, I mean, of course my business has to make money, but I, I cut into my profits and shared that with the artist because I want, wanted to share that. I, it was an opportunity to connect with the art, art community and I want that. Um, and I, I had to not do a lot of nudging. Um, so do you think the nudging is good? At some point I kind of thought like, okay, I'll just back off <laughs> because they don't, yeah. they're not always biting. So yeah. I can put, I'll put my phone number in the, in the chat and I, I'd love to, cause I think, I think what you're talking about is like partnerships and kind of promotions. And I think those are, those are really useful and can be mutually beneficial. Like, especially yeah. if you're cross promoting, if you have, um, you know, limited lines with, with various artists, there's a lot you can do there. So I'm cool. totally happy to talk about that yes. more. Cool. So this would be an example of what the arts can, the local arts agency can do for an artist. Okay, go Libby. Yeah, right, I'm putting my email because that's nudging, the best way. Nudging and deadlines. That's what you need to work with artists. You have to have deadlines. Otherwise, they will put it off forever. I'm an artist. I, 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 I understand that. I'd like and I want to comment on the mural. Asking for artistic input is still asking for them to do work. And so my advice would be to say I'm interested in doing a mural here. If you're interested, show me examples of your past work and choose an artist from that and then move forward on a design together but to just blankly say i'm asking for artistic input it, it asks them to put together something without a commitment from you cool would you say that i that it would be a good idea to do do that publicly but then what if you know like i can't afford to pay 30 artists for their input you know like necessarily as a exactly. as an organization so i would put out that you know this is a mural that i'm looking to do this is my budget for it if you're interested 
please reach out with examples of your past work. Okay, cool. Thank you. That's a great suggestion. And I just wanted to say that this would be an example, like I said before, about a local arts agency or an arts organization and actually bridging the gap between businesses and artists. And that's kind of the one of the seminal things about what a strategic arts plan and a local arts agency can do for your community is it can be that bridge between artists and business, between artists and education, between artists and all these things that needs to be funded and supported because maybe that arts agency would have money to then support Jesse putting that mural up and giving the artists a bit more money. So, you know, how we, how you look at that, um, it's, yeah, it's cool. <laughs> Yeah, and using fiscal sponsorship can be a really um, good way to make grassroots things happen. Um, in the town of Laytonville, about 10 years ago, um, we collected donations from businesses and then had um, a local uh, art con contest where a 16-year-old actually got to design the, the banner, the welcome banners that, that are throughout the town, and we paid for the fabrication. So sometimes, you know, that, that can be a way to make it make something happen and yeah, we're running up on time jessica uh looks like she has a comment i did i had a question up here and it kind of um it may pair well with jesse's question too um it's kind of more about like how do we bring about bringing in that money to fund public art um and so my question up here was um what are the elements that need to be included in a comprehensive and competitive public art grant proposal to get some public art um projects going um one of the things that a project where i'm actively working on this right now it, um, as a volunteer um caltrans is going to make some streetscape improvements to highway 162 through town if they get their funding fingers crossed and i'd like to make sure we have things like public waste bins benches whatever other public art maybe we can weave in the mural um improvements jesse i don't know um and so, and I've reached out to Elizabeth Raby already, but what are the elements that really are gonna make our proposal um, top notch to get funded? And what are the things I need to make sure I put in the grant project proposal that might not occur to me as a lay person? So, uh, public input. I'm gonna way to, to like any funder wants to see that the community is asking for it and has has like a hand in the in defining what it is whether it's thematically or and caltrans understands that better than any i think government organization anytime they do anything to the street they have a community input session and that is where you get the buy-in so so at, on the other side like applying for funding for um you know to, to fund the project, they're going to want to see that that took place or that there's a plan for that to happen. Um, but Caltrans is actually, I think they're adding public art to their back into their budget. So they there may be a framework for managing this the, and maybe even like a percentage of the project just goes to that and then there's a framework to follow and, and there won't be actually a need to seek outside funding. That's possible, but I think that community input um, piece would still have to happen. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to jump in because we are at time um, and and there's been some good conversations and you get a great question, Jessica. I would just say um, build a coalition, especially when working with Caltrans because they're they're kind of a, a universe unto their their own. Um, but they'll, they'll, they'll listen, but you don't want to be the, the one voice in, in reaching them. And and maybe I'll just leave that with this conversation is that I think the more we can build these regional alliances and work together so that it's not one voice, that it's the voice of our arts leaders, it's the voice of the public, it's the voice of just everyone, which is everyone whose lives are impacted by art and by culture. And, and that when we talk about economic development, we, we often talk about, you know, the, the reason people care about economic development is because we want to live good lives and art and public art is a way that we can all live good lives together and i think that's what is really pervasive about these conversations is that it's helping not just myself live a good life but everyone in my community 
And that's why the arts are powerful. Um, for one of, one of the reasons. So um, we'll, we'll close it there. Thank you so much, um, Swan Asbury and Jill Richards and Libby Maynard, Alyssa, Alyssa Weir and Jackie Dandenau for, for being here today. And thanks to everyone who put on the conference.